Welcome everyone. Some of you know who I am. I'm Vera Yelenek, the Divisional Dean of the Center for Global Affairs at the School of Professional Studies at NYU. I want to welcome the students who are in the audience, the faculty, administrators, and CGA friends and supporters, all members of our global community. It's hard to believe that 10 years have passed since the center was launched. It has been a joy ride, and I mean that. In those years, we have grown, not only in numbers of students, quantity and quality of programs, outreach and programming for the international community, but also in implementing change by educating and inspiring our community members to become global citizens capable of identifying and implementing solutions to global <coughs> challenges. That is our mantra. We have, what we have to show for it, are almost a thousand recently minted graduate students and numerous certificate holders who are working in the private sector, in peace building initiatives, humanitarian assistance, refugee relief, government and international agencies, think tanks, and much more. And the same is true of our amazing faculty, full-time and adjuncts, who bring their professional experience to the classroom and apply their research and expertise in the field. And in terms of our communities, I would be remiss were I not to mention the NYU School of Professional Studies, which is our home and which has allowed us to grow and to prosper. Dennis DiLorenzo, who's sitting right there, has allowed us to do this and is with us tonight, and special thanks go to him. Tonight, I invite all of you to consider the past decade along with us, what we have learned, and how we can all move forward. We have invited some of our best friends and supporters here tonight to discuss this topic. I will be introducing our panel later, but now, to spark this evening's discussion, it is my great pleasure to introduce someone who's no stranger to our center, namely Gideon Rose. You have his full bio in your packet. He's editor of Foreign Affairs, author of How Wars End, and other books, former senior fellow and Deputy Director of National Security Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, and Associate Director for Near East and South Asian Affairs on the staff of the National Security Council. He will challenge you to think about the world that was, is, and may be. I hope we can all continue the discussion throughout this year as a community of global citizens. And now, Gideon Rose. Great to uh, be here. This is a wonderful center. It's been an amazing addition to the city and to the broader world uh, in helping us think through the, the age we're living in, the age we have lived through in the past, and uh, what uh, we're going to be com what's coming down the pike and how we should respond and react. Uh, we had a great panel. I mean, a lot of specific issues that we could cover. Um, I thought uh, to kick it off, I would just talk a little bit about not so much the, uh, the weather, but the climate. In other words, there's a lot of stuff that's news and that happens and there are events in the papers, um, but there are broader trends that <clears throat> help drive those things and uh, that, that, that take you in a different direction. I was struck by this watching the remake of uh, uh, the, the Ra expedition movie, Kantiki. I don't know if anybody saw it or it's called the original one. And it's interesting, because here you had <clears throat> this guy putting aside the question of where people came to, uh, uh, came to Polynesia uh, and Latin America from, and whether there was direct connection. The, uh, the question that Thor hired all created this boat and tried to sail it from Latin America to, from South America uh, to Polynesia. And pretty soon the, sorry, thanks. Pretty soon uh, they were unable to steer, and pretty soon they were at the mercy of waves. Uh, and on the other hand, they were able ultimately to make their way across the ocean because the tide carried them there. 
And I thought this was an interesting metaphor because if you think of sort of leadership as uh, the seamanship and captainship of, and the person on the rudder uh, actually steering the vessel, and if you think of events and news uh, as the, the immediate conditions in which you're sailing or trying to maneuver, um, those are one thing, but there's also the broader currents that go along uh, the ocean uh, of history. And in some ways, even if you have terrible leadership or no leadership, and even if you have jumpy waves and, and, and chop uh, all around you, you can still get somewhere particularly quite interesting uh, if you're, if you're uh, being carried in the right direction uh, by the current. So what is it that marks these la this last decade? Uh, and what would mark the next decade? And what are the lessons that are applicable? It seems to me that if we take a truly sort of step back, longer term perspective look uh, at what's happened, and if we add to it the years preceding it, what we see is that this really will go down, I think you can make a good argument for, as the age of globalization and information technology. Uh, these factors, uh, an increasingly linked together world and the rise of technology that has essentially uh, yoked us together and provided ever greater information uh, technology power to all sorts of things, has had two great effects. First, it's disempowered existing authority structures uh, and existing institutions, whether in politics or economics or society or in international relations. Across the board, Okay, the, the giant pillars, the strong command uh, authorities uh, have been undermined, disintermediated, uh, relegated to, if not the sidelines, then at least uh, 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 undermined in their power uh, and authority. While smaller, newer uh, actors, often weaker actors, uh, have been empowered and enabled to have great effects. And the second thing that's happened is that it's linked the world together, so that the silos have broken down, not just between organizations, not just between economic areas, not just between domestic international politics and between nations, but the entire world is now living, in other words, in this giant roiling mess. Um, we see this in our social media feeds, uh, those of us who have them, uh, and those of us who don't still get a sense that everything is now interconnected uh, we all know the butterfly effect, and that seemed like news, oh my god, chaos, when you could have the butterfly wings here and it creates some giant effect over there. Now we're living that every day. Uh, our daily newspapers uh, are filled with events across the world and across the spheres, and we see them affecting us directly and often our engagement with them. Uh, all the various news events, or many of the various news events, that we have been grappling with uh, and the issues that have been talked about here at the uh, center over the last decade uh, and the ones that are on the agenda today uh, are in many respects derivative of that. Uh, there's a, obviously a continuity uh, to international relations, but there's this broader trend line uh, of change that's occurring. And so the events, even the sort of seemingly straightforward old-fashioned type events like a geopolitical conflict uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, or barbarism in the Middle East can, in fact, be seen as playing out against a very new backdrop and driven by these larger trends. What are some of the lessons uh, for policy, not just substance, that, uh, that we've learned? Well, I think the, I would hi highlight three uh, broad categories of lessons. The first is what the president so aptly uh, said <coughs> as don't do stupid shit. Uh, which you know, he's gotten a lot of grief for, uh, but I think that's actually a, a very important lesson. It may not be all of uh, wisdom, as uh, Hillary Clinton uh, tried to point out recently, but it's a pretty good start. Uh, and uh, not creating giant own goals, not messing things up, uh, taking a Hippocratic oath uh, view uh, of policy, uh, uh, you know, first doing no harm, uh, is not a bad way to start. Uh, there have been so many mistakes, uh, so much hubris, uh, so much negative action across the last uh, uh, decade and a half uh, that uh, I think policymakers uh, stopping digging and, and generally uh, thinking, being more careful before they act and avoiding clearly uh, uh, ill-fated endeavors um, driven to them by either simplicity or, or ideology or politics or short-term thinking. Uh, would really be an appropriate start, starting place for future lessons. And, and there, you know, th this is not controversial. Things like knowing what you want to achieve 
before starting down a particular course of action, uh, it, it, war being a perfect example. Uh, I, I say in my book, the one simplest lesson from my book on how wars end, which usually is badly, but the lesson for the future is, instead of thinking of uh, war as a sort of sequence of events, so one, two, three, four. You know, in Iraq, we famously thought of the post-war world uh, and the post-conflict planning as a, a phase four planning for stability operations. I said, if you think of it more like a moonshot, like a countdown, and so you're doing four, three, two, one, and you start with the outcome that you want and reverse engineer that and try to make your actions lead to that outcome, you'd be much better off. Um, and I think that kind of, you know, knowing what you want to achieve at the end before you go in in the beginning, that, that very simple check uh, is, is a, good, uh, uh, a good starting place for things. Uh, knowing what the professionals in a particular area have to say uh, and only setting that kind of advice aside if you have very good reasons to believe on your own that those professionals are wrong is not a bad thing. Professionals don't get things right all the time, but they tend to be more right than wrong and more right than amateurs. It uh, doesn't mean they have a lock on wisdom, but uh, uh, disregarding established professional advice only at your own risk and peril, I think, would be one of the uh, lessons we've learned. But what's the second basket? The first one is don't do stupid shit. The second would be don't be naive. When I teach foreign policy, I, tell my, I always start off my students with uh, what I call Rose's first law of foreign policy, which is that all policies suck, but some suck more than others. Uh, there is no free lunch. Everybody who does policy seriously knows that no options are good, that there's no course of action that promises everything you want, that uh, it's always a choice of trade-offs and alternatives, and that at the end of the day, serious professional wisdom in the policy sphere is usually about priorities and trade-offs and accepting lesser evils than about achieving uh, everything you want. Uh, in the political sphere of political discourse, this is, of course, not true at all, uh, especially in this hyper-partisan era and a highly ideological era. People think, oh, everything I want is good and everything my opponent wants is bad, and they only want the other things because they're too stupid uh, uh, or immoral uh, or whatever, and all we need to do is my answer, and that's going to make everything right. Uh, that is, of course, completely untrue, uh, and understanding that uh, in a world of bad choices, the lesser evil choices are the only ones that you should shoot for. And truly accepting that uh, is uh, the start of wisdom. It doesn't give you the answer, but it gives you a good starting point for not having unrealistic expectations and not trying to achieve things that you'll never be able to, uh, to pull off. Uh, it's interesting to me that the Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration, uh, underestimated and undersold to themselves and to the world, obviously, the costs and risks of going in to Iraq, and that the Obama administration did the exact same thing in terms of underselling the costs and risks of going out. Now, whatever you might have thought about the Iraq war on the way in, and whatever you might have thought about the Iraq war on the way out, this was a lousy situation pre-war, it was going to be a lousy situation during the war, and it was going to be a lousy situation post-war. It's a question of balancing which risks and which costs you want to bear, and who was going to suffer what, and what things you can and can't do, and a realistic professional assessment, whatever the discussion was going to be in terms of should we do this or should we do that, was going to mean stomaching something pretty bad or rather at least standing by while other people stomach something really bad. And yet we seem unable during the last decade to have had the kind of honest discussions that reflect real world practical wisdom of choosing lesser evils. So not being naive, not thinking you're gonna get everything, understanding that you know, the Rolling Stones were right when they said you, know, you can't always get what you want, uh, but if you try, sometimes you just might find you can get what you need, understanding the difference between needs and wants. Uh, it's odd to think of Mick Jagger as a font of political and policy wisdom, but that is one of the great uh, kind of things. Um, in this kind of context, the, the serenity prayer, uh, which everyone knows from 12-step things or from you know, their study of Niebuhr or so forth, uh, is one of the great pieces of practical wisdom for policymakers as well. 
knowing the difference between what can be changed and affected and what can't be, and having the wisdom to make that choice and the courage to go forward or the strength to bear it up. That is, uh, uh, no, there's no better uh, uh, piece of uh, prayer that you could have for your policymakers, and having that, in, uh, uh, that kind of practical wisdom inform uh, discourse would be a great thing as well. Finally, understanding where the currents and trends are and which way they're going and moving with them rather than against them. Uh, moving with the current of your age rather than against it uh, is, I think, a very important thing. And I'll give you just two examples of this. I talked before about uh, globalization and uh, the information technology revolution. Uh, what we are seeing, I think, is the progressive expansion of the liberal order that was uh, first put in place, frankly, after World War II. Uh, we called it the West. It's now expanded in the post-Cold War world to a whole variety of places, including non-Western ones. Uh, and uh, I think the big trend, I'm maybe unusual in this respect, but I'm actually pretty optimistic about the bigger, longer term trends of history. Uh, things have gotten better. Uh, we don't actually worry as much about the kinds of things or shouldn't worry as much about the kind of things we used to worry about in the past. And however bad the dangers are now, they're less bad than a lot of the dangers were previously. We can go into that in the panel if people uh, disagree. Um, but the, uh, but it, that doesn't mean that you're going to get everywhere very quickly. And it, but it does mean that there are some things that time is against uh, some kinds of uh, structures and institutions and policies, and time is on the side of some. Uh, in this whole flap with Russia over Ukraine, the basic driver of this was neither NATO expansion nor Putinist aggression. It was the fact that 20 years after the end of the Eastern Bloc, Poland had managed to leap dramatically ahead by integrating with the West, and its neighbor, Ukraine, was stuck in stagnant uh, uh, cronyism, uh, a mire of corruption and vassalage. And its people basically were, or a lot of its people were like, hey, this is, we want to be like them. Why did, why did Poland's GDP per capita triple over the last two decades and ours not? And so let's try and have, we want some of what they have. That produces a chain reaction, which ultimately leads Russia, which has no soft power resources whatsoever, only hard power to clamp down, ultimately come down, uh, ultimately crack down. It produces this giant crisis that we have going on now. But the fundamental driver at the time here is not on Putin's side. This is, uh, the Russian actions in Ukraine are not a replay of the 20s and 30s. They're not an aggressive dictator moving forward. They're more like a replay of the Soviet Union during the Cold War. In <clears throat> Hungary in 56, or Berlin in 61, or Czechoslovakia in 68, or Poland in 81. These are a defensive reaction trying to clamp down, trying to restrict people in their sphere from going even further out and west. So the Russians in this case are trying, are trying to buck historical trends, right? And the long-term uh, prognosis, I would say, for the Russian actions are quite bad. Uh, time is uh, going against them. Uh, and the sanctions that we put in place however wimpy, however much they won't dislodge Ukraine anytime soon, however much they're not going to produce a giant change immediately, are, you know, like they said at the end of Casablanca, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of uh, their lives, are going to actually have a sort of a significant constricting effect uh, on Russia and a, a sort of pour encourage courage les autres, sending a message about what you need to do if you want to be part of the liberal order. So certain kinds of actions flowing with history, Two other examples of that, and then I'll sort of uh, uh, set up for the panel just to talk. Uh, one is in the Middle East. So just as uh, there are certain trends that uh, you want to put yourself in sync with, there are other ones you want to stay away from because you can't really do much about. The, 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 the collapse of the authoritarian uh, order uh, in the Middle East, uh, that has what we've seen there for the last you know, few decades uh, in which we basically treated it like uh, a gas station uh, run by a very nasty gas station owner who allowed us to come in, uh, park our car, fill up our tank, and move on, but who basically made life pretty miserable uh, for the people uh, working at the gas station and living there above the, uh, the pumps. Uh, that order is breaking down, and it's not being replaced by anything particularly nice or healthy. In the long run, I think it will be, but that's going to be a pretty very long run. And there's a lot of turmoil and a lot of chaos, and 
if we're not prepared to actually provide the kind of order and provide the kind of structure and stability that would enable healthier, broader institutions to take shape, uh, we should be very wary, it seems to me, of dipping our feet in that. Um, the, uh, one of the lessons of the last uh, uh, decade and a half clearly has been that it is very hard to intervene from the outside uh, to affect uh, political change and long-term stable uh, nation building or state building and democratic development from the outside. Now, this is not just something that has to occur internally, but uh, it's something that if you try to do it externally and you're not prepared to stay for a very long time, uh, it's, it's really uh, probably going to end in tears and you're going to be resisted. And, and uh, the, uh, uh, <coughs> Frank Fukuyama was asked at one point uh, why he was no longer a neocon and why he was opposed to some of the, uh, uh, why if he believed in the end of history and the progress of democratic ideals, why he was against uh, uh, some of, the, trying to do this actively in uh, the Middle East. Uh, this is about a decade ago. And he gave a great line, uh, which I think is really, uh, which, which this audience would understand. He said, it's because I'm a Marxist, not a Leninist. Uh, and the, uh, his point being that he believed uh, in the long-term structural trends that tended towards a certain direction in history, but didn't necessarily believe that concerted direct political action from the outside could jumpstart history quickly along those paths. And I think that's one of the kind of lessons we've learned. By the same token, putting ourselves in line with and in the way of the good trends that globalization and IT has, uh, are, are producing is actually a very important and positive thing. And here I would say something that in this kind of audience, I'm not sure, some of my U audiences uh, might be controversial. If you think of the shale revolution and fracking, this, uh, a decade ago, nobody thought that America would have another future as an energy giant, uh, and yet, the confluence of not just old methods like horizontal drilling, uh, uh, but also new IT technology, along with distributed mineral rights, financial and regulatory systems that allowed innovation, allowed a revolution to take place that has fundamentally changed not just the American energy landscape, but the global energy landscape, the global geopolitical landscape, has helped reverse manufacturing trends and global trade flows, and as we've seen in places like Ukraine, or in the Middle East, it has allowed global stability to occur uh, uh, even in the face of disruption in formerly key areas, and it's allowed us to make foreign policy decisions with a freer hand than we might otherwise have. And so while of course there are lots of environmental challenges and while of course these need to be handled and managed well, when you have technology bringing you gifts that you could actually exploit that can do things new and better and more successfully, Knowing when to say yes can be as important as knowing when to say no, and recognizing that we, the United States, and Europe can't quite do this yet, but they should, and if they can't, they will lose out. Knowing that we, as open societies, open economies, democratic systems, are the place where the fruits of a liberal order and an open society and a dynamic economy and an information economy can all come to bear and bring those uh, qualities to uh, a dynamic uh, economic revolution, not just in energy but in other areas of life as well, is one of the great trends of the age that we can and should encourage and go in sync with. So uh, I think just the last thing I'll say is looking forward. I actually think we're not going to be as geopolitically involved uh, and certainly not as involved in turbulent wars uh, in the next decade as we have been in the past. Uh, we learned our lesson. I don't see any major conflicts, uh, major great power conflicts in the offing. Uh, and I don't think that, uh, yeah, it's true actually, I don't. I, I, I see, you know, I think we'll be able to manage the relationship with China. I don't really think we're going to get into a war with Russia. Uh, and I think we'll, be, we'll have learned our lesson enough to stay out of a lot of the smaller conflicts. Um, the economic changes and the social and technological changes that will occur because of the continued progress of globalization and the IT revolution are going to be fascinating. And there, I think, some of the most interesting challenges will be how do we manage to, in effect, keep the goose laying golden eggs, but 
uh, distribute some of the gold uh, to a broader section of the populace because one of the most worrisome trends as I look uh, at the future and look what's going on now but also what uh, is likely to continue to go on is not just continued aggregate growth. I'm not worried about continued growth or development or advance or the future of innovation. I think we're going to keep raging forward in those areas. But I worry about the increasing concentration of wealth, the increasing inequality, the stagnation of the lower orders, and the failure of institutions uh, at political, social, and otherwise to adequately distribute all the wonderful new benefits uh, that are coming along down the pike. And I think that's leading to populism. That's leading to dissatisfaction. It's going to lead also to bad policies if we can't develop better ways of, in effect, making sure that large numbers of people across the advanced industrial world actually benefit from all the advances that are coming and not just as the buyers of ever cheaper and cooler consumer electronics. Um, so figuring out in effect the social policy implications for the future of a world dominated by tech entrepreneurs uh, is, is in some ways what I think. And that's not exactly the, the, the challenges we've been grappling with. And so maybe well, the last thing I would say is maybe Learning enough of the lessons about the conflicts of the last decade and learning to avoid getting entrapped and wasting blood, treasure, energy uh, on failed, stupid conflicts that you probably shouldn't have been in the first place. Uh, and then saving at that uh, energy, that uh, attention, uh, those resources in order to figure out how to revivify our domestic political economies uh, so as to uh, make them uh, uh, work better for all concerned. Uh, that would be, I think, the, perhaps the greatest challenge of all going forward. With that, let's, uh, let's go on to our panel. Okay, you've got me back again. You hear me? Yes? Good. In reacquainting myself with the bios of our distinguished panelists, I realized that each has played a role in the history of the Center of Global Affairs. So I'm going to introduce them chronologically, not by age or alphabetical order, but by when they first contributed to making CGA what it is today. Please hold your applause until I've completed my introductions. Bill Keller. Editor-in-Chief of the Marshall Project. In 2003, then Executive Editor of the New York Times, before there was a Center for Global Affairs, and we were in a brownstone on 10th Street, he was in conversation with Michael Kaufman, a legend at the New York Times. The series was Worldly Conversations, Perspectives from Globetrotters, we're delighted to have him back. Phil Alston, professor of law at NYU School of Law, co-chair of its Center for Human Rights and Global Justice Program, and currently special UN Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. He moderated one of our earliest events, again, before there was a Center for Global Affairs. It was in 2003. It was a conversation between Alex Borain, a good friend, former deputy chair of the South Africa Truth and Reconciliation Trials. And then, at, at that time, Justice Navi Pillay, who was most recently, until September, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Carolyn Kisan, CGA academic chair, leader of the Energy and Environment Concentration, an extraordinary teacher, and I mean that, and mentor, and the second person to be hired full-time as faculty at our center. Alexis Gelber, award-winning editor and journalist, and top editor at Newsweek, now, luckily for us, host of a popular CGA series called Newsmakers, perspectives in global media. And finally, Gideon Rose, who I've already introduced, so I'm not going to go over that again. But finally, our evening's moderator, Arthur Miller, came down with a terrible virus and is not with us tonight. But we are very, very lucky 
to have Jim Trout, who also was with us at CGA twice, actually, 2008, when he was a panelist on the UN and the US, the, the, the relationship between the United Nations and the United States, and more recently in 2012 in a panel that we did on the US elections in the global context. He's currently at the, he's a fellow at the Center on International Cooperation here at NYU, and he has kindly stepped in, decided to have agreed to step in as moderator. He's also a columnist for foreignpolicy.com, has written extensively about um, all sorts of global affairs issues and urban issues in the New York Times Magazine and the New Yorker. He has reported from any number of peaceful countries, including <coughs> Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Egypt, Iran, Sudan, Guinea-Bissau, I can go on. His most recent book is The Freedom Agenda, Why America Must Spread Democracy, Just Not the Way George Bush Did. He's <laughs> currently writing a biography of John Quincy Adams, and he teaches a class on foreign policy at NYU Abu Dhabi. Um, we are thankful and delighted, and you're in for a treat to have him moderate this series. So thank you very much. And first, I'd like to apologize for not being Arthur Miller. Uh, I know many of you have come to see Arthur wag his marvelous eyebrows, and I, I don't have those eyebrows. Um, but I've watched Arthur, so I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, and I will, I will function both as uh, moderator, and to some extent, I'm going to give myself the right to be a, a participant as well. So I want to start with. Uh, Gideon's rather, I think, hopeful uh, take on the world, which was refreshing because we're just so accustomed to hearing that everything's going to hell. Um, and, and what Gideon said, I think, is that the advice he would give is that American leaders should try to go with the clear positive trends in the world and, and not try to entangle themselves in things they can't do. Yes. And, it immediately made me think of our poor president who in 2011 announced that he was going to make a pivot to Asia. And in effect what he was saying is I'm going to make a pivot to the place that embraces the things Gideon was talking about. Globalization, information technology, uh, all the things that will lead to prosperity and stability as against the Middle East. And it, I think that fact reminds us that the world seems to be increasingly dividing between those peoples and regions that embrace those things and those that don't. And so I want to start by talking about, by asking about the, the don't. Um, and so obviously we've got this um, terrorist situation in Iraq and Syria uh, led by a group that violently rejects modernity. So what I'd like to first, let me ask you Bill first, um, should we feel, as perhaps Gideon does, and I want to ask him as well, that this is a terrible thing, but we are maybe exaggerating how grave a risk it is to world order or to ourselves? Or should we see this as something which is a, a deep threat to the world that the United States wishes to create, and which requires something like the kind of response which President Obama has ordered up? I should probably preface my answer by saying that the last time I came down, uh, it was to discuss the fact that I had become a reluctant supporter of invading Iraq. So anybody in the audience who remembers that will probably want to take what I have to say with a grain of salt. Um, I've spent a lot of time since then retracting bit by bit that um, reluctant uh, point of view. Um, 
Well, I think that ISIS clearly requires some kind of a response. It, it does not require the kind of response that George W. Bush or John McCain would, would probably advocate. I mean, clearly it should be taken seriously. I, I do think there's an element of hype. Uh, I think watching those videos has caused uh, you know, what was a sort of theoretical concern, an academic concern to turn into a very visceral concern. Um, uh, and that's one of the downsides, I guess, of the globalization of information. Um, uh, I have um, a lot of things to say critical about the, the, our current president and his uh, approach to the world. I generally approve of his caution. I think he's erred on the side of caution a few times, but I think on ISIS, he's got it about right. So you would say the, the coalition he's put together, the bombing and so forth, is a pretty good balance? Yes, I would. Okay. Um, actually, the last time I was here, I also um, uh, had some fun at the expense of Tom Friedman, with whom I often disagree. So I, 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 I've just, I brought something along that Tom Friedman wrote that I actually agree with, which I, I propose as a sort of framework for how to think about this world. He's, he's been writing these columns lately about how it's the world of order versus the, the world of disorder. And bear with you, bear with me. He says, and, th and this is his prescription for how you approach the problem of this bifurcated world. He says, where there's disorder, Libya, Iraq, Syria, Mali, Chad, Somalia, collaborate with every source of local, regional, and international order to contain the virus until the barbarism burns itself out. These groups can't govern, so ultimately locals will seek alternatives. Where there's a top-down order, think Egypt or Saudi Arabia, try to make it more decent and inclusive. Where there's order plus decency, think Jordan or Morocco, Kurdistan, try to make it more consensual and effective, again, to make it more sustainable. And where there's order plus democracy, think Tunisia, do all you can to preserve and strengthen it with financial and security assistance so it can become a model for emulation by the states and peoples around it. And last but not least, be humble. We don't have the wisdom, resources, or staying power to do anything more than contain these organisms. So that's an important space to occupy between the McCainite do everything and the um, isolationist do, do nothing. Um, Carolyn, let me ask you a, a, a variant of this question. Then I'm going to be happy to have any of you step into this. So is it, is it is it, is it plausible to fear that this thing that we see with ISIS, which is this organization which is capitalizing on the sense of embitterment, outrage, alienation, isolation, uh, a movement towards a more reactionary view of Islam, that this may not be a one-time only event, that maybe in fact what we're seeing in ISIS is the first of the would-be caliphates, that maybe in fact Nigeria is going to have something like this, and, and, and Yemen, and Somalia. And in fact, the world may be confronted with these ungoverned spaces which turn into these terror states. Uh, well, yes, I mean, I, I, think, I, I think we're already seeing that. I mean, I think you see it in Nigeria, you see it, um, I see it in, for example, in Central Asia. So um, when you look at, for example, a country like Uzbekistan, which is highly authoritarian, um, you have you have groups, you have radical groups, the Islamic movement, for example, of Uzbekistan, who has come out very forcefully in support of ISIS. So where you have, you don't have those spaces for any kind of um, involvement in, in government, um, where they're very much sort of isolated, that I think ISIS sort of speaks to, uh, to the disenfranchised, to those that want to see um, a stronger Islamic movement within their states, um, where governments, for example, as I, as I said, you know, throughout Central Asia, where they really are trying to um, contain the Islamic movement, um, ISIS is sort of a, 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 a movement that they feel that they can attach themselves to, and that I find very frightening for a region that, that I know very well that um, that sort of right now, it's it's relatively stable, but it's it's very vulnerable uh, to successionist change, 
Um, and I think in terms of Nigeria, as we were talking earlier, um, you know, this is a this is a country where the disparity of wealth is just so so extreme. You know, a country that's very very rich in resources, and there's been absolute like abhorrent mismanagement. Um, so I think the you know the opportunities for these radical groups are 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 great, and I, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's very frightening. So it also means new region to worry about. You weren't worried about the stands, okay? So everybody now, when they go home, should add that to their list of things that are gonna keep them awake at night. Okay, so that raises a question which I'd be eager to hear about from anybody. I mean, I think both Gideon in saying that it's not in the United States' interest to try to reverse trends over which it has very little control, and the thing that Bill read from Tom Friedman, which said, when you have these either chaotic situations or thuggish states, maybe you can work with the neighbors, but there's not a whole lot you can do. So what happens? See, we see this situation where things that are terrible and terrifying for the neighborhood, and possibly, we don't know, quite dangerous for ourselves, are brewing, and yet we have this hard-earned sense we can't do a whole lot. So what's the answer to that? Again, this is something for anybody. When you look around, not just right now at ISIS, but these other places, Yemen, Somalia, whatever, should the United States just accept the fact that it's bad, but probably the wisest policy is to let it burn itself out, to use Tom Friedman's words? <laughs> who, wants to, who wants to take that one on? Someone's well, got to. Uh, uh, Philip? Go ahead. Go on. Well, uh, I guess on any panel you need someone, uh, you need, need an extremist, so Please, perhaps yeah. I should take that position. Um, I think that the uh, policy response to ISIS um, is sadly mistaken. Uh, I don't think there's any such thing as a limited military engagement, particularly one which involves bombing. I think we are going to inexorably be drawn into a larger and unending conflict. I don't think any American president will have the courage to say, this exercise failed, unfortunately. Those bastards have won, so I'm withdrawing. It's not on. So what we are on now is a slippery slope. I think the problem is that for a whole range of reasons we have demonized um, Islam. Uh, again, uh, since Bill uh, only reads the New York Times, I can refer to uh, <laughs> a column a couple of days ago um, about the different faces of uh, Islam and how we need desperately to start distinguishing uh, those extremists who are not perhaps so different from deeply fundamentalist extremist Christians or other religious groups and not to think, my God, ISIS is going to suddenly take over, it's going to be an Islamic state. We have to stop that. We actually can't stop that if it's going to happen and our bombing won't prevent it. So I think what we need precisely is the 10-year strategy, if you like. In other words, how do we deal with this? And I think it's quite plausible that the ISIS people, a bit like Boko Haram, may well have sat down and said, how do we provoke the silly old United States and Australia where I come from, which follows the US in absolutely everything. Um, how do we best provoke them and draw them into all of this so that we have an enemy, which we really need, and that's going to be the best recruiting tool. Well, and so I think we're going stop, right down you, the road. I want to ask you something. Yeah. Let's say you're wrong. <laughs> okay, let's I, don't, say, I don't accept that premise. Okay, let's just, it's a hypothetical. Let's say you're wrong, and in fact, it, 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 the United States takes your advice, chooses not to act, uh, essentially allows ISIS to consolidate its control over this vast area of Iraq and Syria. Now, let's say we don't know, obviously, what their goal is. They probably don't know beyond this caliphate, but let's say their next goal is to begin to attack the near abroad and then the not so near abroad. It becomes a great place to incubate terrorist acts against Europe and the United States. Would you then say, ah, that was a mistake on my part, or would you say, we have to accept that's one of the prices we're gonna be paying in the world going forward? 
Uh, I would say that I grew up in Australia during the era in Southeast Asia when we talked about the domino theory. And the domino theory, my friends, was that if we let Vietnam fall, the rest of us are in for it. And I think we're tending to do the same thing here. I think, as um, Friedman said, maybe you've got to let these outfits burn themselves out. I think if ISIS comes to power, it's going to be a tragedy for the people who suffer under it. But over time, they will show themselves very clearly to be utterly incompetent and not able to be tolerated, and there'll be a pushback. So Alexis, but I think domino theories are really bad for policy uh, discussion. So Alexis, I'm curious, do you buy Philip's analogy? That is to say that this is like the idea of international communism in the 1960s, and it is just as mistaken to have an aggressive response to it as it, might, as it was, let's say, to do so in Southeast Asia, thinking, if not here, then you know, every place else. Well, you know, there is a certain way in which uh, the, the presentation of the news, because of technology, is creating a sense where we're a little bit confused about what's the smoke and what's the fire. Obviously, these videos shocked the world. They were savage and they were terrifying. But um, we're living in this kind of um, world where we're experiencing events in real time. We are, um, I mean, maybe there was a delay of two weeks between one beheading and the time in which the video was released. But I think there is a sense um, of this kind of 24-7 um, kind of news cycle where we are, um, Create, we are getting a sense of, of immediacy and urgency and a sense that we need to act. And, and would you say that Obama wound up getting, in effect, railroaded to excessive action by virtue of this public outrage over the beheading of these two journalists? Um, you know, it, look, it, it, it was terrifying and, and, and it, was, um, it was shocking and the repetition of this was part of what made it seem like it wasn't going to stop. So perhaps if you want to call it railroading, maybe... Um, but do you think, do you, would you say that it was a mistake on his part? I mean, Bill said his strategy on balance, correct. What's your uh, so I'm not sure that it was a mistake, but I am concerned concerned about uh, the, uh, the pace of, uh, of the reaction. So Gideon, what's your thought about this? You know, a decade or more ago, Bill famously uh, wrote a, a piece in which he called himself a member of the, I can't believe I'm a hawk club. Uh, I, I kind of feel the opposite now, like I, I'm a member of a, I, I can't believe I'm a dove uh, club, uh, because I've been on the opposite side of many of these debates, uh, but you know, like, like the, uh, <laughs> character in The Music Man, I'm sort of sadder but wiser now. And um, I think that, yeah, I think he was railroaded, and I think that uh, the president <clears throat> all too often starts out with a sensible policy and seems to get uh, stick with it for a long time and then get sick of taking a lot of heat for it and tries to give a speech to make the heat go away, but does so in a way that simply exaggerates the heat because he commits himself to a larger goal and then does something and keeps going forward. I actually am not that worried about mission creep here because I think he ultimately is not going to get dragged back in too much. Uh, but there's a danger of that, and I think we didn't have to have that quite that danger. I mean, I guess what I would say here is I think the broader picture of what's happening uh, in the Obama foreign policy is the reestablishment or readjustment uh, of the notion of a core and a periphery. Uh, before 9-11, um, we had a sense of, of core and periphery in the world, and there were areas that we had expanded into uh, after, the post -Cold, after the Cold War ended. With 9-11, suddenly the entire world seemed like it was core, or rather there was no such thing as a periphery. You had to pay attention to everything that happened everywhere, we, you know, micromanaging the political development in Fallujah and, uh, you know, Helmand or whatever was, was crucial. Uh, the Obama administration clearly wanted to get away from that and has been trying to restrict the notion of core, uh, pull back a little bit, but the question of, they're, they're getting pushed back because we no longer like to think of that. I, the people who say, oh, what Putin did in Ukraine is a first step and he's going to keep going forward and Estonia is next. I don't think there's a chance in hell that Putin is going to attack Estonia. I mean, there's, a, uh, there's a, all the difference in the world between NATO and not NATO. And the fact is he can attack Ukraine because Ukraine isn't in NATO. 
and whether or not you think we provoked him by think, saying we might want to take Ukraine in NATO, the, Ukraine was not part of the American defense perimeter. There are other things that are, and we have a commitment to that. And however much we might have been a little slow or hesitant in the reaction to the Ukraine crisis, I don't think anybody in the world has any doubt that if you actually did something against NATO country, the Article 5 security guarantee would come into play. And in the same kind of way, so if, you know, what, what, the, you had several steps in your hypothetical uh, after Phil talked about sort of when we would start to worry about uh, uh, ISIS uh, after they did this and did this and then did that. Well, before that happened or at some point along that way, other people would start to worry too. Uh, my father used to have a rule that I liked, liked, which was if three people tell you you're drunk, go and lie down. <laughs> And I think that's actually not a bad rule for international relations as well, uh, in the sense that I'm not a big multilateralist in principle. I don't actually necessarily believe that there's a huge amount of principled uh, reason for doing things multilaterally instead of unilaterally. But if you can't even get a whole bunch of people who are supposedly at risk to worry as much as you do, then that's a kind of sign that things aren't yet ripe for action. And it's also going to be a sign that's going to be difficult to act. If the things you talked about started to happen, Phil, uh, Jim, then suddenly you wouldn't have quite as much uh, difficulty pulling together an anti-ISIS uh, coalition. It may be a little tougher down the road, but the fact is we used to say in the uh, Middle East process, you can't want this more than the locals. Right now, we want to be anti-ISIS more than everybody else around them, and that's not a, uh, a wise move or a practical recipe for success. Bill, I'm curious if, if you've changed your views on Syria. My recollection is that you felt strongly that Obama, and I think you repeated it just now, that Obama was too unwilling to act in Syria in the face of an unspeakable atrocity. Do you feel now that that moment is, has, has passed? It's become I do. I, I mean, a year and a half ago, I thought there was still, and longer ago than that, I thought there was a, a real chance that he could actually influence events for the, for the better. Uh, I'm much more dubious about that now just because of the way things have evolved. But um, uh, I'd really like to hear from both Phil and Gideon, I guess, the, the, who now belong to the, well, let's just wait and see camp uh, regarding ISIS. What do you actually think is likely to happen if we back off, withdraw our support from the Peshmerga, uh, you know, say screw it to the Iraqis and stop bombing, that they will get Syria and Iraq with um, the largesse they've stolen from every bank that, and all the oil revenues they've, they've countered, that they'll settle for the, Sir, colonizing Syria and Iraq and turn into Luxembourg? Or what, what exactly do you, at what point do you begin to get a little bit alarmed about these um, barbarians? It's I'll, you. I'll my answer is going to piss a lot of people off. So. If, if it's too difficult for Gideon to answer, what, what fool am I to step in? Um, well, uh, I, uh, my principle, first of all, I don't like what's happening there, believe it or not. So I think the United States, I think other Western countries ought to be as supportive as they possibly can. I think what we need to get beyond is the sort of knee-jerk reaction that the United States has long been very fond of, which is that we have to use military action to demonstrate the seriousness of our concern. Military action has generally not been very effective in recent years. It hasn't been effective in Afghanistan. It wasn't effective in Iraq. Uh, and I don't think it's going to work in this context. By the way, do you think that, Libya was a mistake? The Libya intervention? Uh, give me time. I'll need to think about that. Uh, I mean, I think it's a very mixed bag. I, um, I didn't uh, actually support it uh, at the time. Uh, now I think the Libyan situation is pretty tragic. Uh, how else would we have brought about change? I don't know, but that's a bigger topic. But, so let me, different question yeah. then. If, if uh, would you say that uh, Obama should have permitted uh, ISIS to take Baghdad or really to move on Baghdad if that's what would have, what would have happened absent any kind of American airstrikes? Uh, well, first of all, that uh, premise is very much open to question. Uh, but secondly, uh, I think if you've got a movement that is that powerful that is able to mobilize that many people 
that it can take Baghdad, how's the United States going to stop that? Are we going to just continue to up our military involvement? Are we going to, we're going to put all the boots back on the ground and we're going to be fighting a, what would, by definition, be a pretty huge popular movement? I don't think that's a good move. Well, I have to say, when, when Harry Truman gave a speech in 1947 saying that the United States has to step into the vacuum in Greece and Turkey because the British can no longer do so and we fear that uh, this will be the soft flank for a Soviet movement, it may have been a mistake. I, I don't think it was, but it certainly sent a message to the world that the United States feels that no one save it is able to be a kind of guarantor of world order. It created the precedent, which I think we're seeing now, that nobody wants to fill that vacuum. The United States winds up filling that vacuum. It's a disaster to fill that vacuum. And yet, if you don't fill that vacuum, the disaster may be worse. But Jim, you, he said Greece and Turkey. He didn't say absolutely everywhere. Uh, and uh, That's and not true, fact, actually. The Truman Doctrine said absolutely everywhere. The, We're going to start in Greece and Turkey. The globalization of uh, containment and the ex exaggeration of the Truman Doctrine into this broad ideological commitment arguably was one of the mistakes of the early Cold War uh, that, that helped lead to some other problems, such as Vietnam. What I would say is, uh, uh, <coughs> Bill asked what I would do about uh, ISIS and stuff. I, Someone asked me the other day what I would do, about, what I, did I agree with Obama's policy and not what I would do? I said I would do, 50, I would do the same policy, but 50% of it and talk about it 80% less. Do 50% do less and talk about it 80% less. Um, and in, I, don't th I think you made a straw man in the sense that not going into bombing in Syria doesn't mean that you have to walk away or abandon all of uh, Iraq or the Kurds. Um, I think you can give a little bit of help. I think containing it, I agree with exactly what Tom said in that column. Um, the fact is, ISIS has expanded to its natural limits, right? This is a place, uh, this is a group that has preyed in the petri dish of the chaos in Syria and Iraq, and played on the sectarian divisions in Iraq because the Sunnis were alienated by the Shia government that was incompetent and vicious and uh, uh, excluded a large swath of the country. So that's why they could expand into Iraq. They've reached the limits of that. The Kurds are pushing back. The Shia are pushing back. There's no place for them to go. They're not going to go north because they don't want to draw the Kurds in. They can't really go too far in Syria. So what's going to happen if we can contain them in the areas where they are now? Um, they'll do a lot of damage in the badlands of Syria and Iraq and the Sunni areas of Iraq. This is not good. It is possible that over time that might lead to some problems elsewhere. It's going to be certainly crappy for any of the populations living in that area. But at the end of the day, that strikes me as a lesser evil. In the long run, they have no answers to modernity. They have no answers to governance. They have no answers to a broader geopolitical picture. And they ultimately will fall afoul of things. And letting them fall by the wayside while keeping the problem contained until then, um, you asked when I would go in if they went after the oil fields in terms of significant and dramatic ways. Oh my God, that's such a horrible realist answer. Why do we only care about the Middle East because of oil? Well, the answer is yes. If they actually were to go after the oil, uh, they are going, they're able already to going so. after the oil. I mean, that, and that's and that's partially what's funding ISIS is the fact that they, you know, they're bringing in millions of dollars a day. They're selling oil. They're I'm selling oil to Turkey. I'm going after it by destroying it or not selling it. If they sell it and they get it, so you know, that's actually in some ways ironically less bad. Well, but I would just, I mean, yeah, I just, I just want to throw one thing. Is I mean, it, it, it really disturbs me. I mean, in terms of going back to Syria, is that I mean, horrific crimes against humanity and the fact that. You know, the United States and the international community, I mean, 200,000 people were killed in Syria. And I, I just, I think to say that, you know, we, yeah, I think we should have done something. We should have done a lot more earlier. I think so let, let me ask a different came. question, though, which is, which is one of the things Obama has tried to do and clearly not succeeded in is finding a language to speak to the American people that will make them feel like foreign engagements are worth, are worth doing. And as a question going forward, how is it you're going to be able to shake the American people out of what now seems an apathy and an almost a surly hostility about foreign engagements? So I think Gideon's idea is let's focus on the things that are, that are positive and, and, and successful. And again, Obama tried to do that and, and hasn't been able to because he's gotten sucked back into the Middle East. And so I wonder what's the, what's the language, what's the way that you can actually persuade Americans that deep engagement with the world is in not just the world's interest, but Americans' interest. And footnote, I wonder if Gideon's realism, his pragmatic realism, is the kind of language that the American people will respond to. I'm skeptical of that. 
I certainly don't necessarily think people would respond well to it. I have no idea how to sell the policies. I just come up with them. I don't <laughs> Anybody if I knew how to do what you're saying, I'd run for office, but I don't think I ever would. So, you know, because okay. I wouldn't, no, would, no one would vote for me. Just, you know, quickly, we're, we're all language people up here. We talk or write for a living, and I think we overvalue the effectiveness of words. Uh, and I think the effectiveness of words has actually been diminished as everybody's access to er every pair of ears on the planet has grown. So I think the idea that if Obama just pitched the case differently, Americans would rise up in support of him. They rose up in response to a video of beheading, right. uh, they, but they have not responded to a fireside chat, nor, nor do I think but, they so would is likely the, to. Is the underlying fact that, America, that the default condition of the American public is not isolationist necessarily, but certainly uh, a sense of a kind of uh, ill-tempered self-sufficiency, except at moments of threat. And therefore, we just shouldn't expect that when the 9-11 sense of threat subsides, the American people are gonna be that interested in being engaged with the world. Is that just the reality, Alexis? Um, I think that uh, what, what the American public is just war weary. And I think that, uh, you know, the engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan with repeated recruit deployments um, uh, and, and the sort of images of these sort of wounded warriors and, uh, you know, have, have left these kinds of uh, scars in, in terms of the public sentiment. And I don't think that the president, who thinks of, who thinks of himself as a writer, too, um, and has uh, somehow been frustrated in his ability not to give the great speeches anymore. Um, it, it's, it's not going, the, the words are not going to lift people out of their skepticism and cynicism. Um, I, I Is do, there something that will? Um, uh, you know, I think, I think the, the videos were very scary and they shocked people into maybe wanting to do the right thing or wanting to act. But I think that there is a kind of uh, a sense of uh, uncertainty and a fear of getting uh, sucked back into um, a kind of endless engagement. Military. Well, so Philip, your, your field is human rights and you'd like to see a, a foreign policy that was more deeply infused with those moral obligations. I assume that's a fair assumption. Uh, do you feel that that's something that people will respond to if, if this president or some other president was more explicit about America's moral obligations? This, in effect, is almost the opposite of Gideon's point, uh, that that would actually be the kind of rallying cry that people would respond to? Let me just say, first of all, in response to your earlier comment about the American people's wariness or weariness of international engagement, that so much of that conversation is about military engagement. And that's, and my point is that America shouldn't be thinking of its engagement in those terms. So I'm happy for wariness and weariness. Uh, but where it has to engage is in a much broader range of issues. Ebola, um, the various economic crises and so on, there, there is no choice, and I think the American people realize that globalization is a reality, and they've got to engage. Okay, how, for example, do you, I mean, I, I think, I, I, don't, I don't think, I think you're being too, uh, too, too generous to this problem. I mean, uh, Americans believe that development assistance is 10% or 25% of the budget or something crazy like that, and they know that it's bad. It's, it's, it is at a certainty that, Helping other countries is a waste of our money. This has become a kind of shibboleth. Uh, how do you overcome that problem? Uh, well, uh, sadly, a lot of uh, international assistance is a waste of money, it has to be said. Um, I'm not in the camp with uh, Jeffrey Sachs and others who think that uh, the more truckloads of money we can ship out, the happier things will be out there. Um, I think the real challenge, since you put it, uh, in the development area is not development assistance, but is getting things like taxation and fiscal policy uh, under control. The biggest problem in Africa, uh, I was in the Central African Republic last month, I'll be back there again this month in a different context, but I've got a reasonably good feel, are things like corruption. Uh, money, uh, mention was made of Nigeria a moment ago, an extremely rich country, money leaking out in all directions because we in the West 
don't really want to try to staunch the flow. We don't insist on the transparency initiatives that are out there so that oil companies have to declare their money and so on. Well, what's the leverage we would have to do the right thing in, in, this, in these cases? We are currently in the context of the OECD, the Rich Countries Economic Club, discussing all sorts of measures relating to transparency, relating to tightening up tax regimes and so on. Both the United States and the European Union are very reluctant to go all the way. We're much more interested in protecting our multinational corporations and others than we are in enforcing the sort of transparency that would stop the corruption, that would stop the failure of so many countries to collect any of the taxes that would enable them to do much more than any of our development assistance could do. Is, is any kind of assistance to badly governed countries, to corrupt countries, is that a waste of money, no matter what the form is? Because unless it's a decently governed country, it's just going to be pissed away? This is a question I'd be happy if anybody would like to address, because I think we really, you know, we have to figure out what good can the United States do in the world and where? Well, I would say yes. I think one of the great innovations uh, in social, international social policy has been uh, the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, which are now uh, being replaced or are going to be followed on with the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, the conditionality of aid uh, in return for, uh, you know, aid in return for changes and, and certain kind of policy things was something that was kind of revolutionary back uh, 15 years ago. It was seen as a cold-blooded and hard-hearted approach, and it's worked very well. And I think we have learned that sort of unrestricted aid is usually not, uh, to, to governments that don't uh, do good things with it is not a helpful thing for anybody and breeds a kind of reaction. I think in terms of the answers for the public or the, what they will support, I think they tend to be very pragmatic. The American public is not stupid. They don't like being talked down to. They're not manipulated easily with emotional appeals. They want competence. And they want competence and sort of practical idealism. Uh, and in terms of the language we could use, I was reading a piece, there's an interview in the, um, in the Atlantic, this current issue, I shouldn't talk about another publication, but it's true, with Bill Clinton. Uh, Jim Bennett did an interview with uh, Bill Clinton in the Atlantic, and he was talking about the CGI, the Clinton Global Initiative. And I actually am not a huge, huge fan of it, because I think some of it's kind of silly stuff and that doesn't actually work. But the way he was talking about it was so good. I could see my, it was that typical Clinton reaction. You listen to him and you get carried along, even if you think the guy is sleazy, even if you think <laughs> he's a political hack. I was like, by the end, I was willing to take out my wallet and give to the Clinton Global Initiative because he was making this case for competent action that would actually produce results in a positive way with people who were doing effective change. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. That's the kind of thing people need. They want competence. They're cynical. They're upset. They think their politicians lie to them. And they have very good reason to, because the last 15 years of public policy have been a giant screw up across the board. And uh, I think if we had better policies with uh, more honest sell salesmanship about them, uh, people would, would go well, along. So, Carolyn, let me, uh, I'll come back to you in a second, Alexis. So, take these countries that you know well, that none of us know anything about, <laughs> these countries that end in Stan. So, it's obviously in the United States' interest to make those guys feel like we care about their fate, especially because, as you say, they may be on more of a precipice than we realize. Is there any, I mean, does the United States have weavers to actually either earn goodwill or make a difference in places like that? Or is that mostly going to be beyond American control? Um, I mean, I think if we go, if we look at sort of Central Asia, um, I think the United States sort of had more interest maybe in the, in the 90s. But if we, for example, just look at the last decade, I think it's, you know, China's footprint is all over Central Asia. I mean, they are, you know, they're funding pipelines. Um, they're all over across the, you know, the five Central Asian countries. Um, they, have, um, they have given tremendous amounts of money, some of them loans for oil, loans for natural gas. So it very much looks like China's neighborhood. Um, um, very much so, much more so than it did, for example, in the 1990s. But that's true of Africa, United right? States in other words, so Chinese interest. investment in Africa was tiny in the 1990s. Now it's 100 times the size. I mean, mm -hmm. is that a soluble problem? China is going out untrammeled. It has an enormous amount of capital at its disposal. It loves to build big things, dams, railroads, stuff like that. The Chinese like that. Dictators like that. How does the West compete with that? 
Well, I mean, I think it kind of goes back to your other question. I mean, do we do we need to compete with that? I mean, this is this is this is this is China's sort of neighborhood. It's it it makes sense that China would invest in Central Asia. I mean. Uh, the region is very rich in natural resources. China needs those resources. It's um, in terms of for energy security, it's easier for China to get oil from Kazakhstan than it is to get it from Nigeria. Um, they don't have the same sort of marine um, in terms of maritime um, issues to deal with. Um, you know, but I don't think that the United States should completely disengage, but I think our soft power in the region has very much diminished. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's very much Russia and Which would be neighbor. what? I mean, that means more diplomatic outposts, or what's the kind of soft power that we used to have that we don't have and that we should have? We used to do much more in terms of uh, funding non-governmental organizations. We used to have, I think, uh, just a a better reach and 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 uh, sort of we did more in terms of uh, diplomatically and I think that you know over the last ten years we have sort of our, our sort of space in the region has has changed and I you know partially it is a result of um, you know of, of of Afghanistan and the United States has you know had had bases in the region in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan and uh, you know some of the I guess actions on the part of the United States that we we no longer have those bases and you know so China has very much sort of in terms of looking at that region um, China's uh, sort of in terms of and and I, I think it's also important to note and this goes back to also the way that China sort of deals with countries in Africa is that they're not asking a lot of questions so the idea is that the majority most of this region is very authoritarian right. um, in terms of rule of law does not really count for very much um, freedom of the press is kind of non-existent and China doesn't ask any questions and we we do and so it's easier for the region to to work with have a comfy China dictator to dictator relationship yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So Alexis, what were you going to say? I, I just wanted to make another uh, point about uh, public opinion. And I think that um, uh, we're looking ahead 10 years. And I think one thing that we can't um, underestimate is generational change. I see an, a number of students in this room. And um, the generation, uh, my kids' generation, kids who are in their 20s now, are, I see, much more engaged uh, with the world than their predecessors of the last uh, decade, perhaps. Um, they are themselves much more ethnically diverse. Uh, they have families that come from a wider range of countries who have you know, immigrated here. Um, and they themselves have a sense of engagement with the world. Uh, my own feeling is that these, this is the 9-11 generation. They were deeply affected in ways they didn't even really understand by that event. Um, they um, uh, don't necessarily want to see military engagement, but they care about engagement with the world. And they are volunteering for things. They want to um, present, uh, do, they want to do good in the world. Um, and I think that that is something that may affect the ways in which we talk about these issues going forward and in ways in which we talk about these issues that don't necessarily involve military solutions to, go, to global problems. I, let me just, I want to ask Alexis one more thing yeah. about that very question. So, so there's now all sorts of forms of social media in, in, intermediated engagement. There are these organizations like Avaz, you know, where what you do is you basically check a box and say, yes, I think we should ban whaling or something like that. And I can't tell if this is a, a genuine form of engagement that we should really be encouraged about, or if it's a kind of lazy shortcut that doesn't lead to much. Um, well, I, I'm not really familiar with that, but I do see a lot of, uh, I mean, I've spent time, you know, at the Kennedy School, I've seen students going to, uh, interested in going into public service, going to this, want to work in the State Department, they want to work for um, uh, uh, NGOs in different parts of the world. I, you know, this this is something that's going on. I do think the interconnectedness of digital life makes it possible for people to um, 
to engage in different ways. Um, I would also say that I just impressionistically have the sense that this generation also is much more familiar with global travel than their predecessors. So they've had an experience of engaging with the world in a very practical, personal way. So Gideon and Philip. Yeah, I, I actually, I'm gonna go with that and take that same point, but take it in a slightly different direction. You're talking about what, is our, what are our soft power resources. You know, when Joe and I first coined that uh, phrase, he, he meant it as an alternative to hard power in the sense of hard power being the resources that allow you to get somebody to do what you want them to do, and soft power being the things that allow you to have them want what you want. And the idea was if they wanted what you want, you wouldn't need to coerce them because they'd already be there. Uh, and uh, in that sense, it's not so much a manipulable act like diplomacy as opposed to that. It's almost the qualities of your institutions, your uh, values, your ideals that allow people to want to be on your side. It's the kind of things that make the Ukrainians or a lot of them want to be part of Europe rather than Russia so that Russia has to clamp down. And on that regard, I actually think, talking about the next generation, I mean, we have a kinder, gentler, more cosmopolitan, more diverse next generation. They may be historically illiterate and they may be spoiled and they may be <laughs> soft, and maybe I'm just looking at my kids, uh, but uh, there, there's, there's a, a, a warmth and an openness and a liveliness and a dynamism and a, and a liberality to American society now uh, that, that is still this extraordinarily attractive thing to the world at large. Um, and however badly uh, our society has problems, however crappily we treat our minorities, other people treat them more so. However much there is still repression or problems in different sectors and groups, we, it's even worse everywhere else. And so the, if you ask about what we can do for Central Asia, I'm not sure that much, but if we can have Central Asians, at least the ordinary citizens, saying, gee, I want more like that. I want to be a society. I want to have a liberal, uh, open society in which I can be who I am. I think things like the gay marriage movement and decision uh, is a vast and incredible source of soft power over a longer term in a way that has never been discussed and isn't really relevant to these kind of discussions, but it's huge because it represents a society in which you can be whoever the hell you want to be, and that's what we're about, and you want to live your life uncontested. Other people around the world, especially as they develop economically, especially as they have order, will want that, and they'll look to us as a model if we can get our own public institutional act in order and, be, and live up to our own ideals. Do any of you have the guts to take on Gideon's praise of young people? <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to diss young people here? So, so Philip. Uh, just to come back on the, uh, I suppose, on Gideon's opening theme and pick up on a couple of the other comments on information technology and this being the future and so on. Um, you mentioned a vase. Uh, it's a classic example of something that I actually find quite worrying. Um, a vase doesn't stand for anything. There's no underlying values that they support, per se. They support popular movements. They try to amplify popular movements. So I participated in the climate change march, which of us was pretty key in. What did they demand? Nothing. Action about climate change. Um, they take all of the... And so one of the things that I worry about is that a lot of the social media and so on that we put a lot of faith in and we think this is really going to transform the future is not necessarily transformative in fact, even though it might be in process. And then to go back to the more the traditional mainstream, I don't know why Bill is still writing. Uh, it's beyond me because his comment a moment ago was, oh, media, you know, everyone can write now. Uh, there's no point in uh, us really thinking we're going to have a big impact. I disagree with that. Because I think that my uh, dearly beloved uh, compatriot, uh, Rupert Murdoch, um, <laughs> has uh, made a, an enormous difference in the world uh, through what he has done with the media and is still doing. And I think that then links back to where Gideon finished, but in a not quite a throwaway line, but he didn't really develop it big time, and that's the whole inequality thing that we're not doing anything about. And the inequality that we're sitting and watching grow and grow and grow in this country, but also in many other countries, is very much linked to the power of the media and the distortion of the news that's getting across and the opinions that are being uh, promoted. And I think they remain incredibly influential. Well, so let me ask a question about kind of media 
good or bad. Because uh, on the one hand, I think Philip is making the point that, that uh, we live in such a powerful media environment to despair of the capacity, your capacity as an individual to make a difference seems unnecessary, except that what you might say is no individual voice matters very much anymore. Now, I just, I, I've just been hearing from White House officials who for, I've been talking to for an article that I'm writing, the, the identical wine which is the reason why Obama encounters such heavy weather, the reason why he can't get people to buy into his, we were talking about foreign policy, foreign policy initiatives, is we now live in a media environment that is so intrinsically toxic that it's not even about Obama and not even about his policies, but any president henceforward, they would have said probably the last couple years of Clinton, George W. Bush, and now Obama increasingly, any such figure Will, it will no longer be able to enjoy anything like the authority, the sense of authority and legitimacy that his predecessors have, because every word he utters is immediately dismantled, scrutinized, exposed, ridiculed, and so forth. Is that a, is that a, a travesty of the world we live in, or is there some truth to that? Uh, you know, I find it really ironic that uh, the man who was basically the thought of as the first social media president is now whining about this. He, I have to say, I, I didn't talk to him. He yeah. wasn't whining, okay. but his people were whining. Okay, his people. Yeah. No, but I mean, uh, you know, social media giveth and social media taketh away. You know, um, uh, something, uh, it, it may not just be the media, it may be his, uh, his authority as president. Oh, there may actually be substance involved yes. here, you're saying? Yes, I am. Yeah, okay. Um, well, but let's talk for a second, since we're on this subject, um, about the revelations of uh, surveillance and so forth that have become so much a part of our world. So, Bill, you were the editor of the Times when the WikiLeaks thing happened. WikiLeaks right. now seems like some remote <laughs> Uh, event that we can't quite remember what it was about. At the time, it seemed like the end of the world. Has that actually turned out to be a less consequential event than it was imagined at the time? Uh, well, I, it only seemed like the end of the world within a certain media bubble, I suspect, uh, like, like in the newsroom of the New York Times and in the State Department uh, <laughs> in particular. Um, no, I think that was an, an inc one step in a series of steps that has led to where we are today. Bef before that, the Times published uh, sort of seven years before Snowden, the, the revelation that the uh, NSA was tapping our phones without a warrant. WikiLeaks came along and laid bare uh, w how we conducted our foreign policy and our military policy. Snowden came along and um, opened the door even wider. And so there's this kind of ongoing tension between the people who want to keep the secrets and the people who want to expose the secrets. And it's not clear to me that either side is, is absolutely winning because we haven't seen any dire, particularly dire consequences of the, of the exposures that you referred to. Um, uh, but, um, but it's a war. But so it's also interesting that when the, after the Snowden revelations about the NSA surveillance, there was a strong sense that now that the American people have discovered these dire secrets, things will change. And there were the things that usually happened. There was a high level panel, which made a report to the president. The president accepted some things and then didn't accept others. <coughs> And now the, the effort seems to have stalled. Uh, leading members of Congress have said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I wonder what this tells us about whether this does tell us anything about the national attitude towards these kinds of revelations, towards the fact that we live in a world where we can no longer assume that our emails and other communications are secure. Maybe it's something that, in fact, people accept because they've already accepted it in the private sphere. And though it was a big news event, it's actually not as big a social event as we thought. Oh, I would disagree with that. Okay. I think there are tremendous concerns about privacy. And just this week, uh, just yesterday, two days ago, we saw Twitter suing, threatening to sue to uh, the government to um, release information to its users about government requests for user data. Um, the social media companies aren't actually that social themselves, so they're clearly doing this in response to 
uh, concern among their own users. I think there's a tremendous concern. But so, so Alexis, how do you think this is going to work out? That is, do you see the, the line for what is acceptable for either the state or private companies to know about us being pushed back? Because now that people understand that they've surrendered this stuff, they're not going to accept it? Uh, you know, I, 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 I don't see how that's really going to change, but I think that people are going to be much more careful about their own practices. And then this, of course, raises um, you know issues in terms of our dealing uh, in a globalized world, particularly, let's say, in Europe, where there is a huge transatlantic tussle about privacy issues. Um, and countries like France and Germany take a much different view than, than our government does. And Germany in particular because of their own historical records of uh, over record keeping in uh, the Nazi era and in East Germany. Um, so these are issues that take on a sort of policy concerns as well. So Gideon, you talked about this a little bit in your talk. And uh, in terms of the balance between these new media being liberatory technologies and these new media being instruments of authoritarian control, is it clear to you which one has the upper hand or will have the upper hand? Oh, I think, the liber I think in the long run on balance, the liberating aspects will be more than the control aspects, just because it disaggregates power. Speak into the microphone. I think Sorry. you're not. I, I think in the long run on balance, the liberating aspects will be greater than the uh, controlling aspects, just because uh, it, it'll ultimately be many-to-many -many communication in many different ways and many different things. And uh, I, I, I'm more with the Shirkies than the Morozovs on this, if people follow that kind of debate. <laughs> Um, I think that, uh, you know, one of, this ties actually into the, um, the debate about the next generation because I don't think, I mean, the, one of the striking things about the next generation uh, is that they are growing up with a degree of public self-exposure uh, that most of us over 30, uh, let alone over 40 or 50, find absolutely appalling, uh, and yet they take it in stride. And what that will mean, you know, they, they may be, the, the concept of privacy doesn't seem to exist for those kids uh, as much. Uh, so whether the government violates it, since they're violating it themselves so often, uh, it may not be as big a deal. I don't know, I don't think we're anywhere near the end of the story. We're just in the early stages, as you say, not just a cat and mouse game about who's doing what and will get what, but in about social attitudes towards this. Uh, the idea, I, I can't even frankly imagine what it would be like to, to date I've been married for 20 years, right? The idea of if, you know, when we're on the dating scene now and you could literally Google anybody <laughs> you dated and have their entire life pretty much revealed for you, how, how would that affect, it's like, I can't even imagine that because it's so different from what was true back in the day when I was doing it. And the idea of growing up where you could literally have your entire life revealed on social networks and somebody else wanted to know about you, I, I, that's a new world that our kids are growing up in and what that implications are for their attitudes on a whole range of things, I think I have no clue about. But I know it's different from the old, old geezers. And yeah, <laughs> okay, well, okay, let's just go ahead. And then I'll, uh, I'll I'm just saying, I just want to add one thing, which is that, that there are new technologies that are being created to avoid detection. Yeah. So um, the, uh, the protests that we saw in Hong Kong, um, the, the messaging system that they used was something called Fire Chat, which is something that, um, uh, you know, is off the grid and, and can't be, you know, detected or tapped into. And so, you know, in the uh, Cold War era, we used to talk about the nuclear arms race. Now I think there's a kind of uh, digital t tech arms race going on between the creators of new technologies, which are trying to be uh, ever more elusive uh, from prying eyes, and uh, governments and corporations who are trying to sort of find ways to tap into that information. Bill, what about in terms of the press? That is, here we've elected this president who's a constitutional law professor and everybody assumed that he would be uh, a tremendous change in terms of press freedom issues from George W. Bush and yet nobody has prosecuted reporters more than this guy by an order of magnitude. Is that because it's this guy or because something has changed in a way that has altered the relationship between the press and their, their sources? I think there are a number of factors that work. Um, one of them is that, uh, you know, Democrats have to be more Catholic than the Pope on these, these issues or feel that they do. Uh, and so, whereas you might have expected um, them to be 
a little more easygoing about the leaking of secrets. Uh, on the contrary, they're they're um, you know proving their manhood by indicting whistleblowers. Uh, another factor is... So we is, should elect the Republican <laughs> next because they won't have to prove their manhood on this one. Personally, I had a much better relationship with the Obama administration than with the Bush administration, but that's just me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but one other factor is, uh, you know, the technology that um, uh, has contributed so much good to the world has also made it much easier to track down whistleblowers and leakers. You know, uh, Birds got to sing and prosecutors got to prosecute. And if prosecutors can do it without having to subpoena reporters anymore or as much as they used to, because now they've got an electronic track of, of where every potential leaker has been and who he's been in touch with, uh, it's a lot easier to, to prosecute. And sort of this goes to the other side of Gideon's hopeful view. That is, you're also saying in this case, the technology uh, has the effect of actually restricting the sphere of freedom. Yeah. I mean, I agree with Gideon that, that in the kind of contest between control and liberation, liberation probably triumphs. Um, I'm, I have some doubts that, that, that this is an unalloyed good thing or that it, that it doesn't come with some uh, potentially unsavory consequences. I think, um, you know, the digital age has been, uh, has contributed to a polarization of our society. I think it's probably shortened our attention spans to, to some detrimental mm -hmm. effect. Uh, it's also inevitable, so um, you know those those downsides are the price we pay. Okay. I want to ask about something else Gideon raised. So, in kind of the catalog of things that we have trouble admitting to ourselves are actually really positive, but are uh, one he mentioned was fracking and the whole idea that that energy, which appeared to have been uh, a scarce resource in a way that would really redound to the Americans, America's detriment is turning out to be a more abundant resource in a way that redounds to America's benefit. So, Carolyn, since that's, again, it's a world you know well, the energy-producing world of Central Asia and Russia, um, should we regard this as, as uh, a, a, a tremendous opportunity for the United States to be able to escape a lot of the things that have restrained it, whether it's relations with the Saudis, whether it's even possibly Europe's dependence, parts of Europe's dependence on Russia, that this world of greater energy abundance is actually going to change political things in a positive way. Well, I, I, you know, I, Gideon already said it. It already has. So, and I think that's, I mean, I, I think people sometimes don't realize what has happened in the United States since 2006. I mean, we produce 70% more oil than we did. Um, we are close to producing 9 million barrels a day. We are already starting to export crude oil, and we're only going to export more in the future more in the future. We are, you know, producing a tremendous amount of natural gas. We are seeing, um, you know, we're seeing tremendous, like, tectonic shifts in terms of our, just our energy landscape. And, you know, if you think back even in terms of, you know, sanctions against Iran, sanctions against Russia, I think that the United States, you know, Having having this tremendous energy abundance has given it much more teeth to be able to um, to implement these sanctions in a way that um, you know the United States has added four million barrels a day. So if you, for example, just look at the you know the headlines over the last year in 2007, you would have assumed that what we're seeing today was then we. Oil would be at two hundred dollars a barrel. Oil is actually the price of oil is going down, and that's like extraordinary. So, in terms of what's been lost in Syria, what's been lost in Iraq, what's been in Libya, the United States has made up for all of the lost global output. And you know, the Gideon had mentioned something about you know that. Um, you know, trust experts, they're not always right. But, you know, when we go back, go, go back to 2004 where, where the, you know, the forecast was for, you know, the United States was running out of oil, that the world was running out of oil, that, you know, we were seeing peak oil and that the United States was, we were, prepa we were preparing to import liquefied natural gas. Now we are, you know, frantically, trying to get it out to export. So, but let me but ask you exactly. Well, exactly. I want to ask the opposite question, which is, isn't all this abundance a disaster for the climate? Because exactly. the only way we're going to succeed <laughs> climatically yeah. is by leaving most of that carbon in the ground. Well, yes, yes and no. I mean, also, again, something that a lot of people is that 
we have actually reduced our carbon emissions by 12 percent since 2006. So we are currently at 1994 levels. And I'm not saying that there's not a lot of work to do, but I do think it's important that, you know, the natural gas has is displacing coal, and that's a positive. So in terms of the emissions from gas are, are less than from coal. Um, you know, there's still a lot of work to do, and we're doing, I mean, I think there are tremendous advancements happening in terms of um, efficiencies. Um, so, as I said, you know, I think there's a lot to be concerned about, about um, with regards to the climate. But at the same time, I mean, we have an economy and we have a global economy that requires a huge amount of energy. And as much as I support renewable energy technologies, we're still not there yet. You must get stoned by your students. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, this is, it's, it's, you could say this is an example of short-term necessity crowding out what is the supreme long-term need. Yeah, so but, that I, but, I, but I also think it's really important to, like, if you look at solar and you look at wind, I mean, there are tremendous advances. It's become much cheaper. So when you look at electricity generation, and I, I you know, I'm, I'm looking at John Bradley here who, um, you know, it's we've radically we're radically changing what's going into our grid and there's much more renewable going into the grid so again less coal more natural gas it's it's again it's you know long term i think it's ultimately better well for so well, let me in the short term <laughs> <laughs> so yes. well uh, you know it's still true that if we continue on the trend that we're on now when CGA has its 20th anniversary, if we have it in this auditorium, we're all going to be wearing scuba suits. <laughs> okay. Or at least bathing suits, just because it's going to be so, so hot. Let me just say one thing. If not just fracking, I think as, as amazing as the shale revolution has been and will continue to be, you ain't seen nothing yet, frankly, uh, as amazing as that is, what's more, even more significant is just how unexpected it was. You know, Donald Rumsfeld used to talk about the unknown unknowns. The fact that our entire energy picture in such a huge industry, in such an incredibly important area with so much expertise, could be revolutionized by technological developments in combination with a sort of capitalist uh, uh, financial system and distributed rights that had allowed a kind of entrepreneurial set of independent companies to experiment and go forward. The most significant thing isn't just the energy, as amazing as that is. It's what the hell is the next fracking thing going to be? There are going to be changes technologically, whether it's 3D printing, whether it's 4D printing, whether it's synthetic biology, whether it's improvements in battery technology, which will allow the grid to do even more kinds of stuff and bring renewables in. We don't know what's coming down the pike on the upside. And yes, we worry about the new things that will happen on the downside from the super empowered individuals who could do bad things. But you know, for the first time in a century, the basic question of what's going to power transportation is in play, right? We had an article in the spring by a serious expert saying that you know, by 2030, probably half the vehicles in the US fleet are going to be electric. That's an astonishing idea. And by then, half the damn cars or more will be driving themselves. And that we don't even, this kind of stuff, the technological aspects of change and positive stuff is only going to accelerate. It's geometric, it's logarithmic, it's not arithmetic, and it's not just finding a new gas field. You talk about Central Asia. We used to talk about the Caspian Basin, right? That was a big thing 10 years ago. Screw the Caspian Basin. You have, because you, it's just a big field with a pot of oil under it. Now you can have technological development that'll get more out of the existing. So, so now. it's intoxicating to hear about a kind of self-perpetuating uh, positive cycle. Uh, nevertheless, when we think about the fact that that these c climate issues are not national, they're purely global. Doesn't I mean if the United States helps, that really is good. But absent the capacity to reach some kind of under, mutual understanding, which includes both Western countries, which are doing great things, and third world countries, which whatever good things they do are more than canceled out by the fact of their growth and thus their increasing use of carbon and so forth, of, of coal, I'm sorry, raises a political question, which is, is there reason to feel a confident that on climate, but I would say not even only on climate, on other kinds of global issues, nuclear non-proliferation, things like that, that there is anything like a will, this is something Obama has been trying very hard ever since he arrived in 2009 and had very little success on, that there is a will for the kind of collective, collective action without which it's very hard to see your way to solving the problem. Anybody have any thoughts on that big question? 
Well, I mean, just in terms of climate, and you know, Phil was talking about, you know, in terms of international development, and Obama has just recently said that all international development assistance will have a climate resiliency component, and that's part of, you know, something that the United States government is doing. You know, I think, you know, I think China, which is, you know, the world's largest emitter of carbon emissions, it's it's facing a, a very hard reality in terms of that they cannot continue doing what they're doing. They have to change. Um, they have to start moving away from coal, and they're doing that. They're doing that partially through natural gas. So I'm not really answering your question in terms of what is the, the possibility or the likelihood of um, sort of global international uh, cooperation. You're saying it's necessary, change. but of course, many necessary things don't happen. Well, yeah, I do think it's necessary, and I think we, I think we do have to have, um, we, we have to be doing more. But at the same time, I think the United States and, and is is sort of moving moving forward. And as I as I pointed out earlier, our own emissions, you know, have gone down and will continue to go down. I mean, in terms of the forecasts are that we will, you know, go down another. Uh, five, six percent, you know, by 2020. Okay. You Let me, hope yeah, go ahead. that I'm right about the upsides of technological progress because all the other methods of dealing with the problem have zero hope of, of success. You're okay. never going to get international agreement. You're never going to get significant changes. You're never going to get painful, costly economic adjustments. So uh, I hope we don't have to go to geoengineering. I hope we can do changes in the technology of energy itself uh, that will help deal with the problem. But if I'm wrong about the upside to the technological progress, then we really are screwed. Well, it's a matter of degree. It's quite, you have to be really, really, really right, because obviously the problem is very urgent. So let me, let me end by asking each of you to do this. So, so Gideon began by setting a tone, and I think the tone was, it's too easy to get mired in all the terrible stuff that's happening. And if you look on balance, you'll think, actually, trends are more positive than negative. So I'd like to ask each of you just to talk for a, a moment about the things in the world that you find encouraging and the things in the world that you find discouraging or despairing, and, and if you'd like, your kind of intuitive sense about what the balance between the good stuff and the bad stuff is. So, Philip, I'm afraid I'm going to start with you because you're next to me. Uh, well, um, just uh, to avoid your question for a second, the, uh, in, terms of, in terms of international cooperation, uh, Ebola uh, is uh, a central uh, issue uh, because it highlights the extent to which we have blocked that out as a problem affecting a few benighted African countries and nothing to do with us, but I think that uh, there are loads of global health issues which will demand a much more uh, sophisticated and developed international uh, or global health regime. Uh, the World Health Organization has just been weakened basically uh, considerably in recent years. We've been happy to see the Gates Foundation and others taking over. I think that's a real problem. I think we need to build up cooperation there. Uh, you mentioned human rights before. I didn't take up your opportunity. Obviously, I think that um, the, uh, what I'd call the human rights revolution in terms of the empowerment of women, in terms of putting those issues on the international agenda big time, uh, is extremely important and is going to play a big role in uh, various societies coming to realize that the authoritarian regimes, and I would include the ISISs and others of the world, uh, don't uh, offer them what they increasingly are demanding. And so we need, as a society, as a, as a country, the United States and its allies, to be pushing much more strongly uh, for the strengthening of the human rights regime. Alexis? Um, I, like Gideon, I am a, a sort of a, an optimist about the power of technology to transform our world. Um, uh, Ten years ago, uh, you know, we were all using much more primitive forms of telephone communication. There were even social um, uh, evolutionary biologists who theorized that maybe we would grow much longer thumbs evolutionarily to deal with our blackberries. Um, and um, I think very few of us currently use blackberries. Um, uh, we're living in the middle of a revolution right now in technology. Um, and we don't know whether we're at the beginning of it, or the middle of it, or the end of it. But um, 
of 7 million people, of the estimated 7 million people who live in the world, um, uh, the UNS... Billion. 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 billion, sorry, sorry, billion, sorry. Billion people live in the world. Uh, sorry, an estimated, uh, uh, there are 6.8 billion cell phone subscriptions. Um, and uh, this is from a UN technology agency. Um, uh, people who don't have running water are, uh, have cell phones. People in refugee camps have cell phones. Um, the UN has a, a, a group called UN Global Pulse is able to kind of do early warning um, about uh, famine and drought and, and, and uh, crises by just analyzing cell phone pattern behavior um, from the developing world. So I, I find all of that fascinating, encouraging. I don't know where we'll be in 10 years technologically. I don't know what we'll be using. Um, but I do remain hopeful about that. The things that worry me are, um, uh, like, like Philip, I'm very concerned about public health issues. Um, I think that uh, the advances that we've made in some spheres in uh, biomedical research have also had a kind of counter effect. Um, antibiotic resistance uh, has created whole new bugs that have uh, the power to infect and kill people. Um, I'm very concerned about um, our commitment and the world's commitment to these public health issues. Uh, I'm optimistic, as you can tell, about the power of technology in a whole variety of areas to make dramatic improvements in life in a lot of different ways. Uh, I'm pessimistic or worried about uh, the stagnancy and sclerosis of our political institutions in the advanced industrial world that seem to be unable to provide effective uh, governance and effective policy approaches to a whole variety of things. We have a very sobering piece by Frank Bukuyama in the current issue of Foreign Affairs taken from his new book that is all about the decay of the American political system and I uh, sort of stagnantly sliding in place in a mire while the world goes on. We're doing better than others, but that's not a very optimistic thing to be at the end of history and have your institutions suck. And I have to say, if I really, uh, if I'm wrong, I worry that I may be wrong about the climate stuff. In other words, if I look down the road and I think what are the things that are really big game changers in a negative way, uh, the way other people used to worry a little more about nuclear weapons. I never worried that much about nuclear proliferation, frankly. Um, but I, I, I worry that I may be wrong and overly complacent about climate because since I don't think we're going to do anything on the international institutional front, um, if the gloom and doomsayers are correct, then we really are going to be in big trouble. Uh, I listened to Gideon's um, opening keynote and to his, his uh, subsequent comments, and I kept thinking to myself, I thought I was an optimist. Um, uh, I think I am an optimist, actually, maybe not quite to the degree that Gideon is, but uh, and, and um, at the moment I'm spending my time um, building up a small journalistic organization that's focused on the criminal justice system. Uh, and even in that um, sadly dysfunctional excuse for a justice system, uh, I can see causes for optimism. Among other things, it's one of the very few places in our political life where there is actually some overlap between right and left uh, about the need to reform mass incarceration. So that's a good thing. Uh, you know, I have, I put some hope in technology, not quite as much as I think Gideon does. I put considerable hope in uh, generational change. I think the millennials have interest and attitude whether they become active, whether they sort of attach their idealism to causes and go out and fight for them is, is yet to be seen, but I have, they, that makes me optimistic. Uh, the two things that worry me, I guess, are, uh, criminal justice aside, the polarization of our politics, and not just in the United States, but globally, uh, and complacency. <laughs> I'd like to end on a positive note, so I'll start with the things that worry me and I'll finish with the things that um, I'm hopeful about. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, climate is definitely something I'm very concerned about. I mean, I think that, you know, the climate is changing. I think there are many parts of the world, including right here, um, where we're not, uh, we're not doing enough to create the resiliencies that we need. Um, I'm very frightened by the dysfunction in government. I read the, uh, Ms. Gideon was pointing out in terms of the most recent issue of foreign affairs and the dysfunction and the decay, and that, that frightens me um, that, you know, young people also are just going to become so disenfranchised and feeling so disconnected from government that they're not going to want to participate. And that, I think, is, is, is very troubling. Um, education, I think we need to do a lot more to make sure that we have quality education, not just here in the United States, but around the world, making sure that um, girls are, are represented in the classroom and, and creating uh, much greater access, um, also on the human rights front. And in terms of what gives me tremendous hope, um, I teach and I spend a lot of time with young people um, who really care about the world and, and making a difference. Um, it's, you know, every day that I walk into the classroom, I, I, you know, sometimes I wake up in the morning and I read the paper and I'm, I'm feeling rather, uh, rather, you know, the gloom and doom sort of, sort of comes over me and then I walk into the classroom and you know I, I hear I hear the ideas I hear the um, you know the possibilities the different ways of seeing the world maybe in ways that that I don't see and that gives me tremendous hope I I have two young two young boys and I have to believe that we're going to do more and and rise rise to you know the challenges that 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 the world requires. So I do remain hopeful in the fact that, you know, we have a, a younger generation that, that, that cares about making a difference. Well, thank you. That was a tremendous display of, I think, judgment and erudition on an incredibly <laughs> wide array of subjects. That was just really great. So uh, please join me for a brief round of applause before I <laughs> ask the question. So, so what we're going to do now is um, there will be uh, persons with handheld microphones um, walking around. And so uh, if you do want to ask a question, please beckon to them. And when you stand up, tell us who you are, and then say something that ends with a question mark. <laughs> So, here, take mine. Okay. I'll just I'll live without it. You know, this is one of the failures of technology. <laughs> I have yet to be at any kind of a meeting where there isn't an audiovisual breakdown. <laughs> but in ten years, it'll be very different. Um, uh, I'm Robert Petersack. I am pleased to be on the advisory board of the CGA, and I would like to congratulate it and and Vera on the wonderful anniversary that they are celebrating here today. Uh, but I noticed uh, that in this very informative and um, very intellectual discussion of the challenges of the next 10 years, uh, that there has been only passing reference to an 800-pound gorilla I have particular fondness for, and that is China. Uh, is that, in your view, because you don't see China as a major challenge, or just that the challenges that China presents in military, political, economic, and other spheres pale compared to the others? I should say it's because I forgot to ask you. <laughs> that, that, that's the only reason why, but uh, please somebody respond to that. Okay. Well, I mean, I think the rise of China is one of the extraordinary stories of, of our era. Uh, it's been a massive uh, good. Hundreds of millions of people have uh, come out of absolute poverty and uh, risen into the middle class. Uh, and uh, uh, the level of development, uh, human development has, that has occurred is wonderful, objectively, as cosmopolitans. We should all like that. Uh, it's on track to continue. Uh, the political system has opened up a little bit. Uh, and uh, because I believe in modernization theory, uh, I don't worry about the very long-term future because I think that over time uh, their development will either lead to social and political change uh, that will modify, modify the system, you know, moderate the system a little bit, or that if it doesn't, it, uh, uh, this, this, so the progress will, will stop. Uh, because you can't really run an advanced industrial society in the modern era from a top-down command uh, approach uh, and have a success. 
Um, so for me, this is a, the practical policy challenge is a sort of generational, uh, long, uh, careful dealing with an adolescent uh, that avoids open conflict and nudges things along until they become a more responsible adult, uh, as, as Bob Zellick said, a responsible stakeholder in the international system. Uh, and so it's a practical challenge, but I don't think of it as a, uh, a disaster. I don't think it's an inevitable war. And it's something you know people in security are aware of and trying to deal with. Anybody else want to respond to that, or should we move on to the next question? Next question. Uh, my name is Gil Kulik. Um, I want to say that I think it was quite striking that it took an hour and 42 minutes before the subject of climate change came up. And I think that reflects a very worrisome um, uh, uh, sense of, of priority. Um, because I think, frankly, that everything else that has been discussed here will become irrelevant if the current trends continue and the, the, global, temper the global climate uh, surpasses the 350 parts per million uh, that have been d defined as the, the sort of the limit of human civilization. And I'd just like to, to ask the whole panel to prognosticate on what the world will look like 10 years from now if the temperature has increased another degree and uh, millions of people are climate refugees, that the oceans are rising, et cetera. You know all of the consequences. I'd like to have some of you cons just prognosticate on how that will affect the international order. Or maybe you could prognosticate on whether you feel that the, the trajectory is gonna, of growth of emissions is going to start curving downwards in a meaningful way. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I, I think in terms of looking out over the next 10 years, I think if you are a small Pacific island state, um, I think there are some very sort of serious concerns in terms of with rising sea level, and I don't think that the international system is at all prepared for it. I mean, when you look at international law around refugees, climate refugees are not, have not yet been dealt with, and I think that that's something that we need to, we need to confront. Um, so, you know, I think there are different parts of the world that will, for example, in the next 10 years could be, um, could be, severely impacted. I mean, I look at the Arctic. The Arctic is, um, you know, it's in terms of climate change, it's, it's twice, I mean, twice as quickly as the, the rest of the world. So as a region, it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely something of concern in terms of the impact it's having on terms of rising sea level. I'm a little less sanguine uh, than you are about, about that. I don't think it's I'm just the kind of drama that's going to transpire in the Pacific Islands or even just in the Arctic. I think we're already seeing consequences. Phil has been dying for us to bring Australia into the conversation. Uh, I think Australia just had a, a historical record heat wave, uh, this uh, heat, uh, uh, high temperature year. Um, uh, uh, and I, you know, it, it's, I, I hope technology will get us out of this and I share Gideon's um, suspicion that there's not going to be some global uh, movement where we all join arms and solve the problem uh, multilaterally, uh, but I don't think that's what I meant by complacency. I, I don't think that's a reason for us not to take a leadership position on this issue. Uh, I think it's the most important issue facing us. Mm. Uh, if, if I can, I mean, I think that the I don't share Gideon's optimism. I'm a bit shocked that someone can edit foreign affairs and be constantly dealing with all the world's crises and remain as um, extraordinarily optimistic as he uh, seems to be. But I do think that's misplaced in relation to climate change. I think uh, that it sure ain't the Pacific Islands that we need to worry about, although many of them are going to disappear. It's all of the climate regions. If you look at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's report, the impact is going to be absolutely uh, dramatic. And linked to that, an issue, another issue that hasn't come up, and I feel a bit ashamed, of course, is the, the continuation of extreme poverty in the world. The fact that there continue to be a million people by the World Bank's conservative estimates and two billion by most uh, experts' estimates 
people who live in extreme poverty, whose position is not being touched at all by much of the progress that we are talking about. Indeed, the inequality persists in those areas as well, and they are not, their boat is not being lifted and we're doing nothing about it. The reason I mention it here is that even the World Bank and others emphasize when it comes to climate change that the greatest impact is going to be on those billion or two billion. We can get our way out of it technologically. They won't be able to. We need a change, a fundamental change of attitude. And a country like Australia is a classic. Australia is now sort of officially a climate change denier. They have repealed carbon legislation. They are churning out the coal and they are pretending that this is not an issue. That's not sustainable. Uh, Phil, I, I, I published the pessimist too. I just don't agree with him. Uh, I, uh, on the climate change, I actually agree with, with Phil on this, which is that I think it's going to have a differential effect, and that rather than not affecting anybody or uh, affecting everybody terribly, I think that you'll see a lot of adaptation in areas that are rich enough or dynamic enough or successful enough or creative enough to, to deal with it, and a lot of areas uh, that are going to be struck very badly. And as usual, the change is, this change is going to screw the world world's poor and disenfranchised and, and weak more than the rich uh, who will find ways of dealing with it. With regard to the Arctic, it's actually a fascinating question because you're not just seeing the Arctic's effect on the oceans. The Arctic itself is going to be this incredible uh, new region of the world that uh, is going to be open not just for business but for exploration and for trade. It's going to be a, a, the, the, the next 50 years. You're going to see places like Reykjavik and Anchorage being the, you know, Singapore's and uh, Taiwan's and, and Hong Kong's of, of the next uh, half century in a very interesting way. Uh, and they'll it, be able to grow cotton there, which is good. Uh, thank you. Uh, Professor Haslund, uh, when, uh, when talking about what could be done to help the developing countries, he, he mentioned taxation. I was wondering whether that's one important issue for, you know, developing countries. I mean, maybe uh, countries that are at mid-level income, yes, but, uh, but I'm thinking, why don't we talk about some old ideas that didn't work? One is, uh, and we, we've, talk, we've talked a lot about technology. What about transfer of technology, which is an idea that came up in, in the 70s, but not much has been done. WIPO has, you know, all kind of schemes and so on, but it's, it, it, it has not worked. And in, in the context of climate change, actually, that's something that could be used to help developing countries. And second old idea that could be used is the idea of um, changing the international regime for foreign direct investment. And uh, we, we're seeing issues with Argentina now. I think that's one area where we could have rules that are more favorable to developing countries and that promote their development. And third old idea that, that's not been really pursued is, in general, um, changing the rules of international trade and make them more conducive to development. Uh, WTO has been working on this, but nothing ca came out of it. So I I'd like to have your views on how those old ideas could be pushed now and give more results. Anybody want to address those multi-pronged questions? Uh, well, I, well, no. 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 Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I mean, what you're describing, of course, is the 1970s agenda for the new international economic order, uh, which has pretty much disappeared from the agenda. But I think we have to look at it through new eyes. I mean, transfer of technology in those days was seen as what are we doing in a formal sense to make technologies available to developing country governments. But as probably Alexis said, I think when I go to the Central African Republic, which is an incredibly poor country, there are cell phones everywhere. Every, uh, the, the streets are lined with these little boxes, which are stalls selling uh, SIM cards and uh, so on. I, so I think we are transferring technology pretty dramatically. I think there are other examples that are much more worrying. Sorry to come back to Ebola again, I'm not obsessed, but um, the fact that we did nothing to try to develop a vaccine when it was only Africans who were dying. 
uh, but now that there's a risk that uh, we might also be affected, we're suddenly pulling all the stops out. That's the sort of thing that could have been done uh, much earlier. In terms of tax regimes, I think, or, or in terms of regimes for dealing with uh, debtor states, and you give the example of Argentina, I think we do have to do something, and there are lots of proposals out there for ways in which countries might actually be able to go into some sort of bankruptcy regime rather than face the black or white picture that has emerged from the US District Court on that case. And I also think just generally um, uh, the promotion of education uh, beyond uh, very rudimentary levels, and, and, and obviously Carolyn was talking about uh, the education of, of, of women, and uh, that is a great boost uh, economically in the long run for any, any society. Um, and uh, it was something that Hillary Clinton uh, had at the forefront of her agenda as Secretary of State, but I think equally it applies to, to, uh, to young men as well. And um, I, I think that's the biggest guarantor for the, uh, the future prosperity of any, any society. Um, I think that actually for something like FDI, uh, that these days there's so much capital looking for a home and looking for a return on investment that uh, developing countries, frankly, uh, can do more to attract it themselves through appropriate reforms than they need help in getting from outside. I mean, if you take a look at countries like, uh, let's say, Mexico under Peña Nieto or the Philippines under Noinoy, I mean, th these are places that are going to get surges of external capital because they are taking steps that will actually uh, uh, make economic development something that the government is trying to support and enable, and they will find willing and uh, eager uh, outside partners for that, and countries that persist in policies that uh, don't seem uh, optimized for that are going to find themselves needing more handouts. And I think that one of the great stories of the decade uh, recently, and will hopefully will continue the next decade as well, is the rise of uh, development and marketization of things like in countries such as Africa, which are coming into the world economy uh, as not just dependent clients or not just targets of aid or not just uh, objects, but, uh, but subjects of good old-fashioned capitalist development um, at early stages that will hopefully, ultimately, with help, with more investment, with a much longer time frame, with institutional reform and change, allow them to follow the kinds of paths that many nations in Asia, in Latin America, and elsewhere have followed uh, to, to become key players in the world economy in, in, in a productive and mutually beneficial way. I think the African Trade Summit over the summer, the U.S. Leaders Summit, was uh, a, a real step forward, both an acknowledgment of what's happened and a real step forward uh, for the future. Can I get my microphone back? Thank you. Maybe I'll say something. <laughs> You have any questions? Yeah, there's one at the bank. Oh. Yep. He's got the mic. We have the mic. Yeah. Okay. Just speak loud. Yeah. You shouldn't have given me back that microphone. Would like to take that on? Corporations, good or bad? Mega corporations, good or bad? I, I think the, uh, I mean, one of the keys here is transparency. Um, it goes, I, I don't want to change the conversation, it goes back though to what you mentioned, WikiLeaks and Snowden and so on. There are two very separate aspects of that whole saga. One is the process. Uh, which is the degree of secrecy on the part of the government, the degree to which we were not informed of the policies that were being pursued very vigorously. And the second issue is the separate one of privacy implications. 
But I think it's the same with corporations, that the big challenge now is to get a greater degree of transparency. And again, that's what the OECD is currently working on, trying to get uh, country by country declarations of the financial interests of each country. So in other words, where is Apple? You know, Apple, the famous Irish corporation, <laughs> because that's where so much of its money is uh, put through, uh, we, don't, and, and we don't get any detailed accounting from them, therefore we can't regulate them, therefore we don't know what their deeper impact on policies is. So I don't think one needs to be counter or anti-corporations, but I do think there needs to be a regime which suddenly makes it more feasible for government, policy makers and the public uh, to start calling them to account based on information about their activities, which we do not have at present. I think we have time for one more question. So please tell us who you are and make it a really good one. <laughs> Let me preface this by saying I graduated from the men why you roughly. We can't hear you, wait, sir. Yeah. Quick, your mic. Yeah. Wait, give the gentleman the microphone, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes that's good. Okay. Now we hear you. And uh, so uh, that means nothing, really. The point that I want to bring up is the cyber war warfare that's going on. Uh, they feel that the last uh, attack against the biggest bank in the United States, Chase, came from Russia. And if that's true, then uh, we're in for a different kind of a war because you can decimate a country overnight because it affects the, all the, the people that had uh, their bank, using the bank as a, a, an outlet, and the same thing with any one of the other people that have been attacked. Now, uh, I don't know exactly what's gonna happen, but uh, the fact that Russia was behind the, the Chase Bank is a very serious situation. They don't know. It, Sir, what is, I just have to, we're getting short of time. What, what's the question you wanted to The question answer? is how would you go about handling this particular situation, which is a warfare that's already started? Okay, thank you. Anyone would like to speak to that? What to do about cyber warfare? I think that's a question for an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I, I, I don't, I, I am, uh, look, there, uh, all the, um, the uh, agencies of law enforcement are being brought to bear on this question, and obviously the, the New York Times story uh, said that the president's first question, or his, or his repeated questions have been, you know, is this just a regular old hacking, or is it uh, Putin? And uh, there are obviously networks of, of cyber hackers in the former Soviet Union, and uh, whether they are also at the direction of political forces, um, uh, you know, you can just, uh, just imagine. But I think that certainly, um, you know, the FBI and other intelligence organizations are going to be uh, looking into this very, very harshly. I mean, this was, uh, I think, as uh, as uh, um, uh, as we were saying before this panel, you know, maybe just a warning shot since none of the information was actually used or corrupted as in previous hacking episodes where people's accounts were, were compromised. So if it was a warning shot, um, it may be a kind of a warning for, for warfare, as you say. You know, I started out by saying that I would consider this the era of globalization. Uh, and you know, globalization is all about increasing flows uh, of information, of goods, of services, of people, uh, of all sorts of things, ideas. And the challenge in that era, right, the great overarching challenge uh, that it's applicable in many different issue areas, right, is how to encourage and enable the healthy positive flows and how to police and constrict and protect yourself from uh, the harmful negative flows. 
and the dangers that come from being exposed and open. Uh, we find that in, you, know, you want to encourage people to go everywhere, but you want to stop the terrorists from coming in. You want to have the containers bringing nice goods and things to you, but you don't want the bomb to come in as well. Uh, you want to have all the upsides of information technology and the cloud and everything else and being linked to the entire world at the drop of a hat, uh, but you also want to protect yourself from the criminals, from the, 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 the invaders of your privacy and security and so forth. There's no easy answer. This is an ongoing challenge in both areas, and I would say it's the cyber issue is a real one, um, and it's the downside of some of the upsides. The only way to stop it entirely is to go off the grid, which we don't want to do because we couldn't cut ourselves off. And this is, that's emblematic of the challenge of the era, which is balancing uh, and uh, the, the, the upsides and downsides of all these flows. We're in a state of flow, and how do we keep the bad guys and bad things out and the, uh, enable the good things and the good guys uh, to, to link us together? That's the challenge. So let me just end by saying I think that what you've all heard tonight is an intriguing um, degree of variation in the sense of how one should look at these next, this next decade in terms of the balance between hopefulness and what there's worth being hopeful about and pessimism and what there's worth being pessimistic about. So that means each one of you can make an existential choice as you go home, whether you should feel better or worse than you did when you got here. <laughs> so thank you all very much for your excellent questions and thank you for coming out tonight.